All right. So I guess before I start talking, breaking it down into the parts, when we're talking about a network or a graph, it's a visual representation of um, connections. So we saw these in uh, matrices where we were looking at either um, like communication or dominance. And we were using networks there as directed graphs. So they had an arrow on them, which showed the direction of either the communication or in terms of dominance, um, the winner and loser in a competition. So we do see those again in networks, which is nice. There's that crossover between matrices and networks. But um, a graph can also have no directions on it. Um, and it can be used to represent lots and lots of different things. So generally, we're talking about objects, okay, like we did in all places, like we did in transition matrices as well with the diagrams there. Um, and a couple of key parts of those. So most of you were able to identify that a vertex is the point, okay? So that's the point on the graph that's representing either the, pe the person, the place, or the objects that we're wanting to um, identify. We usually label them with a capital letter, but often they are just written as a point, okay, with no um, letter reference. But often we will label them to help us with the applications. The edges are the lines, okay, so they're the lines joining um, the vertex. And so in this particular example, we've got a loop here, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, and then one, two, three, four other, so five edges in total in that graph, okay? So it can be a loop coming back to the same place or it can be connecting one vertex to another. And that's those sort of one step direct connections. When we're talking about adjacent vertices, so adjacent means next to, and so in the context of um, a graph or in networks, we're talking about two um, vertices that are directly connected. So there's only one step between them. There is an edge connecting them. So an example there, B and C would be adjacent vertices. So would C and D, but A and D are not. Isolated vertex, we all got that one right. So it makes sense. An isolated vertex is something that is on its own. Okay, I can't get to it. Uh, if I'm there, I can't leave it. So think of it, I'm isolated, I'm like an island. Multiple edges. So here we've got multiple pathways directly connecting two vertices. So the reason we might show that, and often when I talk about um, multiple edges, if we're on site, you think about if I walk from our further maths classroom um, across to the science block, I could go out the door and across the um, elevated walkway, across the top, um, over to the Thorsby area, or I could go down the stairs inside the A block and across the bottom of um, the breezeway there and over to the Sherwood area. And I'm still getting from A block to the Lee building, the science building, but I've got two different distinct pathways of getting there. And that could be represented um, with that multiple edges on a graph. As I said, a loop is something that comes back to itself. Okay, so I can, I have two distinct exits from the location, but the pathway is the same. All right, um, in terms of what that might look like. So again, I could walk out of the further maths room, directly down the stairs, out through the Asselston area, up the stairs, and back into the further maths classroom. And that's a pathway that has two different entry and, oh, sorry, two different ways of getting around back to the same location. Because of that, when we talk about the degree of a vertex, we're talking about the number of exits or the number of different pathways I can leave that vertex on. So if we look at A here, where there's this loop, I could go out this sort of top left-hand side, or I could leave from the bottom edge there. So there's two different ways I could travel on that same edge. And then I also have the edge leaving A going to B. So the degree of A, I would say there are three ways of leaving A. So anytime you have a loop, which I think I said on the previous, a loop counts as a degree of two. Okay, but if I'm drawing an adjacency matrix, which we'll look at later on next lesson or something, 
um, it only counts as one edge, but it has two e exits. Okay, it can be a little confusing. So the question where you had to say the degree of that vertex, I would say those of you who um, most of you were unable to get that correctly, it's probably because you weren't counting the loop as true in a degree. Whereas vertex C, we can see there's three distinct edges leaving it. So that's easy to count as three distinct um, degrees there. Okay. Quite often I think about, you know, can I um, isolate the vertex? So can I almost, you know, just put my hands over it and just look at what's leaving. Don't worry about where they're going. That tends to help. Okay, a simple graph. So this is just now into some definitions of some special types of graphs. Simple graph is one that has no loops, no multiple edges. So this is where we get to the point where um, in a multiple choice question, you might be asked uh, which is the best option to describe the particular graph you've been given. And so knowing that a simple graph has this property where it's just like the stripped back simple version, no loops, no multiple edges shown. A degenerate graph where everything is isolated, it's just vertices, zero edges, okay? You're not going to see that often at all, but it is a definition that you need to know. A connected graph, so this is one where there's no isolated vertices. So it could have multiples, it could have loops, it might not. It might just be a simple graph, but we don't have an, an isolated vertex sort of sitting out on its own. Everything is connected in by at least one edge okay I don't have to get everywhere and it's really important that you know a connected graph is different to a complete graph which we'll look at in a sec a bridge special type of edge that if I took it away I would break my graph into two pieces okay so it's a single edge that would cause my two halves to be disconnected so a bridge makes sense there think of it like a bridge over water if I lost that bridge, I can't get from one area to the other area, okay, where I can still move around on one side, but I've lost that connection in between the two. Um, an isomorphic graph. Sometimes an isomorphic graph is um, called an equivalent graph. So it's just saying I can draw the two sets of information in the same way, okay, sorry, in... Um, same information in two different ways. So if I say to you to draw me a graph that had um, one vertex had a degree of three and had a loop, another um, it, there was one other vertex that had a degree of one, you would all probably draw that in a very similar way, but some of you might draw it vertically down your page, some might draw it horizontally, um, some of you might draw a straight line between the two vertices or a curved line or a wavy line. It all might look slightly different, but they're all actually equivalent to each other. They're all the same information. So that would be, they would be considered isomorphic graphs. All right. So often they're the way to identify whether they do match and show the same information would be actually to label the vertices, but I've just sort of color coded them here. So you've got an example. Okay, nearly through. So a subgraph, I've got a big complicated graph and a subgraph would be just showing a section of it. So there's no new information, but it also doesn't have to contain all of the information of the original. So you can see here the original graph had vertices A, B, C, D, and we had connections as shown or edges as shown, but the subgraph still has all the same vertices, but a couple of these edges have been taken out. So I've just removed some of the information. So it's almost like I'm just looking at a particular section. So if you think of say a map, the map um, of the school, but maybe I just wanna zoom in on what's happening in the uh, K block. Okay, that would be considered a subgraph of the overall original. Okay, so quite often we see those as just sections of the original or a stripped out version. Okay, a complete graph, so I said different to a, um, I've forgotten what I was, connected graph. Okay, different to a connected graph. So a complete graph is a special type where 
every vertex has a direct one step connection to every other vertex in the graph. Okay, we have a little rule that we can use to help us find the number of edges. What these tend to be used for is that round robin tournament. So if you think of this complete graph with five vertices here on the right, that could be five different people playing in a round robin tournament. Okay, everyone plays each other once. And so we would represent who won and lost with the arrows on the edges. But the question might actually be, well, if I've got five teams competing in a round robin tournament, how many games do I need to play so that everyone plays each other once? And that's where this rule, the edges represent a game. And in order to make a complete graph with five vertices, so five teams, I would need 10 edges or 10 games to be played. So that's often, that's a really good example of here's the definition, here's, you know, what the concept is, but how you're expected to sort of jump from definition to application in the exam is that style of thing, okay? And again, we'll get lots of practice and you'll see lots of things like that. But there's an example of that for you there. Final one, I think. Um, final one, planner graphs. So a planner graph means that I've drawn a graph in such a way that the only uh, wet place the edges cross over is actually at the vertex where they meet, okay? So at the moment, this first graph on the left is definitely a planner graph, okay? There's no edges crossing over. Whereas this second graph on the right at the moment hasn't been drawn as a planner graph. So what that might represent there, think about on a freeway, you have an overpass. Those roads are edges, but they don't actually intersect at an intersection because one goes over the other. Okay, so they're not actually intersecting at a vertex, but at the moment they've been drawn so that they look like they're crossing over. So sometimes we might need to redraw a graph to make it look planner. Okay, this one actually is a planner graph. All right, it's just not drawn in that way. So if I show you a different example, here we've got a graph at the moment. We have this, these edges that are crossing over. They're not actually intersecting because there's not a vertex there, but we might want to represent this, draw it in a different way so that we make it appear planner. And so what we might do is actually redraw it so that vertex is now sitting on the inside and we don't have the crossover anymore. And now I have what I can definitely say is a planner graph. The reason we care about this is that we have um, Euler's formula, uh, which talks about the relationship between the number of edges, the number of vertices and the number of faces in a graph. So there was a question about faces in our um, quiz, in our Kahoot. And faces are the regions that the graph makes, okay? So if I was thinking about this graph here, if I was to colour in each section, I would have four sections inside that square, but then I also have this region around the outside, okay? So this would actually have five faces. Whereas if I took it back to its original form, where I had that edge crossing over, it's difficult for us to count how many faces there are. There definitely isn't one, two, three, four, five, six in total, okay? Because we've shown by drawing it in a different way that there are actually only five faces, all right? So that can be a bit confusing, I know that. And there is an additional little section in our notes talking about the faces and planner graphs. And I would encourage you to have a look at that uh, now or at least um, early next week.